to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father? He anticipates what you want. But you have to ask, seek, and knock. And that means when you ask something from the Father, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit that's going to take you on a journey to what you want. He'll give it to you. That's not a problem. It's just that you have to be able to receive it. He would give you, I mean, he wants to give me Nashville. But I can't receive it. And I'm going to show you why in this, in this message tonight. But Kadam means he anticipates the blessings that we are going to ask him. The meaning here is that God has anticipated David's desires. He has gone before him. He designed the blessing even before it was asked. How precious is our father. Blessings where there was no trial. This is precious too. Have you ever had a blessing where there's a little trial in there? Yeah, a blessing of no trial, no shadow, no appearance of disappointment. I get those blessings that there's something attached to it. <laughs> I can't wait to receive the blessings where they're free. It's coming, it's coming. But I have to be enlarged to be able to receive those blessings because I'm not able to receive them. I mean, he gives us abundant blessings. I can't hold the abundant yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> you set a crown of fine gold on his head. That's the next verse. Now, this is different. A lot of people say that this psalm is about a coronation of a king. I disagree. I mean, it might be, but I think it's talking more about this victory because look what happens. Um... You set a, fine gold, a, a crown of fine gold on his head. See, this was a victory. You know, when you crown a king, are they a king? I mean, yeah, technically they have the title. But not until they win a victory. Not until they go into battle and they, and they conquer something. To me, that's a king. The other is just a little boy. Remember how they were young little kids, like 12 years old would step up and become a king. But not until they go into battle and they actually win are they a king. And so he looks like a king now. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. Now look what happens in 2 Samuel 12, 30. Then he took the crown of their king from his head. And its weight was a talent of gold, and in it was a precious stone, and it was placed on David's head. That's when he conquered the Ammonites. He was the king. Verse 4 through 6, he asked life of you. You gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. So this is like answering, like I said, we're, we're going, you know, if I could take Psalm 20 and Psalm 21 right beside each other, it's everything he asked for. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you place on him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with gladness in your presence. Now let's stop right there. Everybody knows I love that word. Presence is panim. And it means in his face. Now, Remember that Paniim is connected with the word wrath. Remember what it says in Exodus 33, 20? God told Moses, he said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. My face. His face shines so bright, it's the consuming fire. You've got to come into the fire if you want to see his face. If you try to hold anything back from him, you can't see his face. That's what it means. But that is the place of joy to a real son. To look into your daddy's eyes. To look into his face. To see his emotions. That's real joy to me. Verse 7 through 10, for the king trusts in the Lord, and through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Now, this is what verse 7 says, okay? To me, it looks like there's a switch, but you got to remember, our God is the God of mercy and righteousness, okay? Keep that in mind, okay? Because it looks like it's a schizophrenic God. 
For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. That's all sweet, right? Listen to this. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. You will swallow them up in your wrath, and fire will devour them. Their offspring you will destroy from the earth. The Bible talks about taking babies and dashing them against the rock. And their descendants from among the sons of men. And that is our God. Because remember I told you, God takes the wicked and destroys their descendants. We talked about the Nephilim and how they're out there to destroy our race. That's why God does that. God told, Je uh, God told Joshua to kill every man, woman, child, and beast. Because they were trying to take over his people. They weren't created by God. They allowed themselves to be handed over to the Nephilim and that type of bloodline. So the point is, is that it's the same God, right? See, God's green horse riders see no difference between the God of consuming fire and the God of love. Hebrews 12, 29 talks about the God of consuming fire. That, to me, is still love. He wants purity. We can't come to him unless we're pure. And I'm not talking about 99.9% .9 pure. I'm talking 100%. 1 John 4, 8 talks about the God of love. God's green horse riders are the same. They offer their very lives as living sacrifices for the sake of others one moment. And the next moment they declare destructive judgment over a particular group of people. Are they schizophrenic? No. No. It is love to lay down my life for somebody. But it's also love to judge that person if I really love them and I don't want to see them throw their calling away, number one, or go to hell. That is love. It gets messed up with the soul realm. They speak of God's mercy and of God's vengeful wrath in the same sentence. In Psalm 59, 10 through 17, Psalm 102, 8 through 13. I just pulled this one right here. Isaiah 60, verse 10 says, In my wrath I smote you, but in my favor I had mercy upon you. It's the same God. It says his right hand, we learned about the right hand. His right hand will expose those who hate him. God's enemies are flushed out by truth, law, and judgment. They don't like it. They hate it. They say, let us cast their cords from us. They don't want to be tied down. Did I see it right that San Francisco has passed the gay law? The, they did something. They, they passed something. Gay marriage, that's what I meant. They passed it, right? Okay, they said, let us cast their cords from us. We don't want them to tell us we can't get married. That's exactly what Psalm 2 is talking about. They hate it. They won't abide by it. They can't hide for long. They can't hide for long because they're boiling on the inside. I will not obey that rule. See, his right hand forces you to be on one side or the other. You can't hide. No hide, no pretending. He says, even their offspring will be destroyed. None of their seed can remain. The sins of the forefathers, remember they're passed on from generation to generation, and what the forefathers sowed, they reap. So it's in them. Unless they know about it, unless they stop it, they're going to be a product of their father. That's why the children have to be destroyed. Verse 11 through 12, though they intended evil against you and devised a plot, they will not succeed. For you will make them turn their back. Now, I've been dying to bring this up because I love Exodus 23. This is the word that God gave me when I was in Nashville. The very first time he really ever spoke something very powerful to me. And I, I broke this down. I've looked at several different things in here and I'm going to show you one. In Exodus 23 verse 27... He says, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. So it's the same thing, right? Turning their back. See, you turn your back to someone when you're running away out of fear. 
Right? When the hornets are chasing